This is going to be a video about chapter 16, temperature and heat, and it's going to have worked examples in it as well. So the first thing is temperature and the zeroth law of thermodynamics. And I know it seems strange to have a zeroth law, but there was a first, second, third law, and then they decided there was something important, an assumption that they forgot to include, so that's the zeroth law. All right, so heat and temperature are two things we want to make a distinction between. Temperature is telling us the average kinetic energy of the particles, while heat is the transfer of energy that's due to objects having differences in temperature. And problem number 16.4 on your assignment deals with this idea of heat. So objects do not have heat. Objects have a temperature. And if you have two different objects that have different temperatures, then energy can be transferred between them. Or in other words, heat flows between them. So you cannot have heat. You can have temperature, and then heat will be, or energy will be transferred between them. You can have thermal contact, and that's if objects are actually touching. So then you can have heat go between them. And another word is thermal equilibrium. And at thermal equilibrium, the objects have the same temperature. So in that case, if they have the same temperature, then there is going to be no energy that goes between them because they have the same temperature. Because energy is only transferred if they have a difference in temperature. The zeroth law says that if object A is in thermal equilibrium with object B, and object C is also at thermal equilibrium with object B. So let's say that we have three objects. We have, um, let's just say that this is a blue ball. So we have a blue ball. And we're going to say that this is the freezer. So if we put our blue ball in the freezer, the blue ball will be the same temperature as the freezer eventually. So they will be at thermal equilibrium. And then I'm going to put another object in there, C, and we'll call C to be um, a red block. And we're going to put red block also in the freezer. And the red block is going to be the same temperature as the freezer eventually. So the blue ball is in the freezer, the same temperature as the freezer. The red block is also in the freezer and has the same temperature as the freezer. Therefore, since those two have the same temperature as the freezer, those two, the blue ball and the red block, will be at the same temperature. And so it says if A and C then will be at the same temperature. So if we have two objects and we place them both in the same environment and they have the same temperature as that environment, then those two would have the same temperature. And it seemed like that should be fairly logical. But they decided that that maybe was an assumption that they should specify. So that's what the zeroth law is. is it's, a, it's stating for sure what this assumption was. And the only different, or the only thing that we look at in deciding if something is at thermal equilibrium is the temperature. In order to be at thermal equilibrium, they have to be the same temperature. All right, so... Here, I have these two objects are at the same temperature, so there's no heat that's going between them. These two are also at the same temperature, and no energy flows between those. Therefore, A and C are going to be at the same temperature. So this is what the zeroth law was telling us. Temperature scales are the first thing we're going to talk about. We talked about heat. Now we're going to talk about temperature. We have the Celsius scale. Water freezes at 0 and it boils at 100. And at the Fahrenheit scale, water freezes at 32 and it boils at 212. And if we want to go back and forth between those, if we have a Celsius temperature and we take it times 9 fifths and then we add 32, that's going to tell us what our Fahrenheit temperature is. Whereas if I have a Fahrenheit temperature and I subtract 32, and then if I take it times 5 ninths, that's going to be my Celsius temperature. So those are the two equations that you would go use to go between Fahrenheit and Celsius.
And when we look at our temperature scales, pressure is proportional to the temperature, especially for gases. And all gases will reach zero pressure at the same temperature. So we can see all of them are reaching over here at the same temperature, negative 273.15. And this temperature is called absolute zero. And since pressure is proportional to temperature, then we could say that P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. All right, and this is an example of that relationship. So P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. And on the last slide, that was negative 273, that absolute zero. These temperatures must be in Kelvin. So I'm going to put in my pressure of 227 millimeters, and that corresponds to a temperature of 100 Celsius. But I need to change that into Kelvin, so I'm going to add 273. 373. My pressure drops to 162, and I want to know what my new temperature is. So to find my new temperature, I have to take 162 times 373 and divide by 227. And I get a temperature of 266 Kelvin. And I could change that back to Celsius if I wanted to. This example is very much like problem 16.7 that you're going to have in your assignment. Okay, now zero Kelvin is that absolute zero, which was the negative 273 that all gases will reach at zero pressure. And if we want to go between Celsius and Kelvin, this is the equation that we would use, and I used that in the last slide because I had 100 degrees Celsius, so I added 273, and that's how I got my 373 Kelvin. The answer that I got in the last slide was 226 Kelvin. If I wanted to change it back to Celsius, I would have to subtract 273, and I would get negative 7 degrees Celsius. And here's my three temperature scales compared. I have Fahrenheit, which we said was 212 and 32 um, for freezing, and we had 0 and 100. And then for Kelvin, it would be plus 273, so 373 and 273. And in case we want to know what the freezing point of dry ice or boiling point of nitrogen is, it's on there as well. This absolute 0 is 0 Kelvin, negative 273 Celsius. Yeah, in this one, I have normal body temperature is 98.6 Fahrenheit. What is this temperature in Celsius and Kelvin? And this is like the problem that you're going to have in your assignment. It's called cooling a soft drink. So I have 98.6, and according to my equations that I had a couple slides ago, if I want to find my Celsius, I have to subtract 32, and then take it times 5 knots. So 98.6 minus 32, I'm going to take it times 5 and divide by 9, and I got 37 degrees Celsius. And then they also want me to find the Kelvin temperature, so to do that I have to add 273. And that corresponds to 310 Kelvin. So there we can go between Fahrenheit and Celsius, and then go to Kelvin. Most substances expand when I'm going to heat them. The larger the temperature change, the more expansion that happens. And the constant that we use is called the coefficient of linear expansion, and it is constant for one particular substance. And every substance will have a different coefficient of linear expansion. The equation that we're going to use is the change in length is equal to the coefficient of linear expansion, alpha, times the original length times the change in temperature. 
And the unit that we're using for our coefficient of linear expansion is Calvin to the minus 1. And of course we said L stands for length, T is temperature, and alpha is the coefficient of linear expansion. And there are some examples of coefficients of linear expansion. And a bimetallic strip is used a lot in thermostats. And it has two different metals on the strip, and they are going to bend by different amounts because they're going to expand different amounts when they're heated or cooled. So in this case, you can see that B is bending more than A. And we have a bimetallic strip, and I'll show you what that looks like in class. Now we can also have things expand in area as well, not just in length, because if it's round, it's going to expand in the total area. So to find the change in area, it's going to be 2 times the coefficient of expansion times the original area times the change in temperature. And we can see here if we have something and we heat it, so here is my ring, and when I heat it, we can see that the hole gets bigger. This would be the example of the hole. So when I would heat up a ring, it would increase in size, and the hole in the middle would be bigger. We can also look at volume, and the change in volume is proportional to 3 times the coefficient of expansion times the original volume times the change in temperature. So very much like the length one, except area had a 2 and volume has a 3. And we're going to have different um, coefficients of expansion. Alpha was what we used for linear expansion. If we want the volume expansion, it's called beta. So we use beta times the original volume times the change in temperature. And here are some coefficients of volume expansion. In this case, I have a pendulum, and we have a large bob that's connected to a steel wire. The temperature increases, and they want to know if the period increases, decreases, or remains the same. So this goes back to a previous chapter. And this is my equation for the period of a pendulum. And we know that if I heat this, that it's going to get longer. So if L gets bigger, that means my period is going to get longer, so the period would increase. The second part says calculate what that change in length is going to be. So the change in length is going to be equal to the coefficient of linear expansion times the original length times my change in temperature. So that says that the coefficient is 12 times 10 to the negative 6. My original length is 0 0.9500. And my temperature change is 150.0. And my change in length is going to be 0 0.00170 meters. So small, but it does increase in length. And on your assignment, you're going to have one that's dealing with a bridge. It's called the, like, the bridge is basically what the name of the problem is. And the other one is 16.22, and they both deal with this idea of using the coefficient of linear expansion. All right, water is a special case. Water expands when it's heated, like most things. And it expands when it's cooling as well from 4 degrees to 0 degrees. And when it gets to 0 degrees, it has a bigger volume. Therefore, it's less dense, and it floats. And because it expands when it's cooled, frozen bottles will burst. So if you have a bottle that's like a water bottle, and you fill it with water, and then you freeze it, it will expand, and it will burst. And you have a problem in your book um, or in your assignments called coefficient of volume expansion, and it deals with water. And this is the chart that we can see for water. So we can see that the density increases up to 4 degrees as it's heated. But then between 4 degrees and 7 degrees, that density decreases and clear over to 8 degrees. So in this case, we can see the density is increasing 
and then at 4 degrees the density would start to decrease. And they've taken this part of the chart um, between 20 degrees and 80 degrees, and it's right over here. This one little piece of this chart, like from 0 to 10 degrees, that's blown up here. So we can see that here the density decreases as we go from 20 to 80. So that would be after this part from 20 to 80, it's going to continue to decrease. But this part of it here, they blew up and it's right here. And that would be helpful for you to look at when you're working with that one on your assignment. All right, in order to do um, work, we're going to talk about kilocalories, and that's the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water from 14.5 degrees Celsius to 15.5 degrees Celsius. And one little calorie is 4.186 joules, or a kilocalorie is 4,186 joules. Another unit that we sometimes use is a BTU, stands for a British Thermal Unit. And a British thermal unit is 0.252 kilocalories or 1,055 joules. And Q stands for heat, <clears throat> excuse me, or energy that's transferred. And Q is measured in joules for SI unit. Heat capacity tells us the amount of heat that needs to be added in order to raise the temperature of a substance. So if we wanted to find the heat capacity, we would take the amount of heat and divide by the temperature change. And the SI unit would be joules per degree Celsius. And Q is positive if the change in temperature is positive, means heat's added. Q is negative if heat is lost. Now specific heat is like heat capacity, but specific heat is saying for a certain mass. So the heat capacity depends on the mass and the specific heat is for a specific material and it's designating the mass because we could see last time the heat capacity was just Q divided by delta T. For specific heat we're saying that's for specific mass. So the specific heat is Q divided by mass times change in temperature and the SI unit is joules per kilogram degrees Celsius and here are some specific heats for different substances. And we can see all these substances have different specific heats. Water in particular has a very high specific heat, which means it takes a lot of energy in order to raise the temperature of one gram of water or one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. So it takes a lot of energy to raise the temperature. So if it has a very high specific heat, that means it's usually has a low temperature change. Think about going to the beach in the summertime. The specific heat of water is very high compared to like the land. So we could think of, you know, things down here that are lower specific heats, which means that you're going to tiptoe across all the sand and it's going to be very, very, very hot. But when you get to the water, since the water has a very high specific heat, its temperature change is going to be fairly small which means that during the day it doesn't heat up or cool down at night as quickly. So it's going to take longer to heat or cool water because it has a very large specific heat. So substances that have big specific heats have small temperature changes. This is an example using specific heat and it says suppose that this much heat is given to a piece of aluminum and they want to know the final temperature. So my equation has M times my specific heat times my change in temperature. So 79.3 joules. My mass I'm going to need in kilograms, 0.111. I'm going to need the specific heat of aluminum. So I'm going to go back to my chart and it's 900. 900 here. And then my temperature change would be F minus 22.5. So I'm first going to multiply those. And then I'm going to take 79.3 divided by those two multiplied. And 
All right, to find the final temperature change, I'm going to have to add 22.5. And my final temperature is 23.3 degrees Celsius. So it changed temperature a little bit, 22.5 up to 23.3. Okay, the next example is like that, except they're saying that I'm going to have this shoe and it's going to go into a bucket of water and heat up the water. And they want to know what's going to be the final temperature of the, the shoe in the water. So I know the MC delta T for the metal, for this shoe, has to be equal to the same heat, the same Q, for the water. So we're saying that Q of the metal has to be equal to Q of the water. Because whatever energy that the shoe loses is going to be gained by the water. And since this is going to be losing energy, it's going to be a negative out in front. So I'm going to put in the mass of my iron shoe. I'm going to need the specific heat of iron, so I'm going to go back to my chart. And for my iron, it's 448. And I'm going to look for water here, 4,186, because I'm going to need that. So 448. My temperature change is going to be F minus the initial temperature of the shoe, which is 450. Then I'm going to have the mass of the water, which is 25. The specific heat I looked up on that chart. And the temperature change here is going to be F minus the initial of the water, which is 23. So I'm going to take 1.5 times 448. And I get negative 672 times F. Then I'm going to take that times my 450. And a negative times a negative is a positive. And again, I'm going to take 25 times 4,186 times F. And then I'm going to take that number times 23. All right, I'm going to add that onto the other side. Then I'm going to add the F onto the other side. And then to find F, I'm going to have to take this number divided by that number. degrees Celsius. So my final temperature start out 450 for the shoe and the water was at 23 and it ended up at 26 and you can see that the water's temperature didn't change very much compared to the shoe. It went from 450 down to 26 and that's because when we compare our specific heats, here's the specific heat for water, huge, compared to the specific heat that we had for the iron shoe. I also wanted to mention that on your assignment, this example is very similar to three on your assignment, one called soda drinking, one of them is 16.38, and the other one is a video tutor that you're going to be watching. All right, heat is going to be transferred in three main ways, convection, conduction, and radiation. Conduction means that it's going to be through direct contact, so they have to be touching in order for heat to be transferred by conduction. And the amount of heat that is conducted increases if it has a bigger area, increases with the temperature difference, so the higher the temperature difference from one end to the other one, the more heat is going to be conducted. 
It's going to increase steadily with time, so the more time that they're in contact, the more conduction there's going to be. And it decreases with the length of the rod. So shorter rods are going to have more heat conducted than longer rods. And the next few slides about this convection, conduction, and radiation is going to be dealing with 16.46 on your assignment. Okay, if we want to find the amount of heat flow that is by conduction, that amount of heat, Q, is going to be K, which is a constant called the thermal conductivity, times A, which is the area, times change in temperature, divided by the length and time. And we said all of these were factors. The area was a factor, the length was a factor, the time was a factor, and the temperature change was a factor. So those are the, all the factors that were going to affect the amount of heat flow. And these are some typical thermal conductivities. That is a chart in your book. And notice each one has its own specific thermal conductivity, each substance, but then it's constant for that substance. And if it has a high thermal conductivity, that means it's a good conductor. If it has a low thermal conductivity, then it's a good insulator. So things like silver are going to be fairly good conductors, while wood, wool, and air, those are good insulators because they have low thermal conductivities. The second way heat is transferred is by convection, and that's through moving fluids like air or water. So in the case here, we can see that we have a sea breeze and that we have heat coming up from the land and going into the air and then it is moved through the air and as it moves through it gives up its heat and it cools back down. And at night we have the same process that's occurring except in this case we have energy from the water that's leaving and it's going into the land. So through moving fluids is convection. And radiation is the third way. All objects give off radiation, every object. Electromagnetic waves are infrared, visible light, ultraviolet. Those are just some examples of electromagnetic rays. And that is how heat is radiated, is through electromagnetic waves. It can be transported through a vacuum, which means you don't need a medium at all. It can go through empty space. Hot objects glow. First red, then yellow, then white, and then blue. So blue is the hottest, and that's why in a Bunsen burner flame we look for blue, because blue is going to be the hottest temperature. Objects at body temperature also radiate heat, but they radiate infrared in the infrared range. And objects that are very, very hot are going to give off visible or ultraviolet. And we can see body temperatures, infrared, we can see them with night vision binoculars because those see infrared. So hotter objects we're going to be able to see, and then even hotter yet, they give off ultraviolet. And when we think about the sun, it produces visible light, and because it's even hotter, it produces ultraviolet as well. And the amount of energy that's radiated is proportional to the surface area. So the more surface area, the more energy that's radiated. The temperature, the hotter the temperature, the more energy is radiated. And the emissivity. And the emissivity is a number from 0 to 1, and it indicates how effective a radiator it is. 1 is a perfect radiator, which means it's going to be the highest number. The closer we get to 0, those are going to be poor radiators. And in order for us to figure out how much power is radiated by an object. We use the Stefan Boltzmann law. So the amount of power that's radiated is E, which stands for the emissivity, times this funny little O shaped here. This stands um, for a constant, and that constant is always this number, times A, which stands for my area, and T, which is my temperature to the fourth power. So we can see here, area makes a difference, the emissivity makes a difference, but temperature by far makes the biggest difference. So the biggest difference that you have in temperature, the most power is going to be radiated. Because it's temperature to the fourth power. So higher temperatures means a lot more radiated power. 
uh, when when we think about light bulbs, the most power is going to be radiated by hotter by hotter light bulbs. So the higher the temperature is, the more power we get out of those. This is a summary of chapter 16. Heat is the flow of energy between objects. They have to be two different temperatures in order for heat to flow. If they are um, in thermal contact, heat can flow through them, but they have to have differences in temperatures. If they are at the same temperature, we say that they're at thermal equilibrium. Thermodynamics is the study of heat. Here's our first law of thermodynamics. Temperature is the factor that we look at to decide if they're at thermal equilibrium. We talked about temperature scales. The lowest temperature was absolute zero. We also talked about Calvin. Those are our temperature conversions that we were using. Talked about linear expansion and volumic expansion. And we also talked about water and that curve that we had for water. And that's because when it's heated from 0 to 4, it actually contracts. Um, we talked about heat capacity and specific heat, and I even did a couple problems here with specific heat. And we talked about conduction, convection, and radiation. And this is the amount of heat that if we have conduction. And one of the problems in your book or in your assignment that you have to do is called the flow of heat energy and that deals with this idea of convection, conduction, and radiation. Talked about power as a function of temperature. Temperature makes the biggest difference in the amount of power that's radiated and this constant is the Stefan Boltzmann constant which is this constant number all of the time. And that's a brief video of chapter 16.